prideful way, notice the passage says, pardon and you will be pardoned. That there's a sense that we're all sinners and that there are, there's a time and a place when we would recognize that the sin that has happened against us, we could pridefully judge, condemn, and treat that individual as if they're the only person on the face of the earth that has ever sinned. When in fact, we know we've done those kinds of things as well. So, are there times when we should judge? Well, Jesus gives us more of the story in verse 39. He says there's a parable of blind men. Can I guide a blind man? Can he? They will both fall into the pit. Pupils not above his teacher, but everyone after he's been fully trained will be like his teacher. Uh, do you and do I have all of the information we need within ourselves to make this goal of leading everybody the way they ought to go? And the answer is no. Without the instructions, we're all blind. We're all blind to the spiritual realm. We're all blind to spiritual things. And so we cannot do this. We have to go to our teacher. And the word of God is the tool that God has given as he demonstrated it through his son Jesus that we can then be fully trained and be like our teacher. And so God does not have the attitude of simply wanting to condemn us, to judge us, uh, but he is one who pardons and one who forgives. Notice in verse 41 in the same chapter, why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye and do not notice the log that's in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. By the way, that's a judgment. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. Now, as you look at this passage, the first thing you're going to see is that I'm looking at my brother, but I'm not looking at myself. Is there a problem? Yes. Uh, this is when we get into problems of pride and condemnation and that sort of thing. I'm not examining myself. But for many people, what they see here, they read the passage and they say, so I'm not going to talk to anybody about any of the sin in their life because who am I? I have this log in my own eye. I have these things in my past. I have this thing I struggle with now. And the problem is, is we say, I'm not going to talk to anybody about their sin and then they go strolling along and they wind up in exactly the same place. And we say, well, I don't want to judge you. You know, I've done all kinds of bad things myself. And yet I could have helped them avoid this pain. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, the wages of sin is death. And as we talk about the death of something, it could be the death of your marriage because of adultery. It could be literal physical death, it, there's no telling the kinds of pain and suffering that people go through. They think that divorce is going to fix everything and it's going to make everything better and then they find out after they divorce, they still have a relationship with this person because of children, because of other things and their complications and difficulties. Ah! What do we do? Well, the scripture says that if we will then have a biblical marriage, Biblical principles, marry a person who is a Christian, who is walking with the Lord, then we can avoid the trap, and they can avoid the trap as well. Will we have problems? Yes. Come on, y'all. We'll have problems. We'll have difficulties. But if our focus is on God, then with our focus on God, we can work out our things because we want to be pleasing to God. So, uh, when you think about this passage, uh, the other thing that people say, well, you know, I, I, this law, it's just always been there. And, and I can't overcome it, and I've tried. And so I say, I've been in this trap all of my life, all as long as I can remember. And the idea comes back and says, who are you saying is inadequate when you say God can't get you out of it? 
you might want to be saying that you're inadequate. But the fact of the matter is, and we learned this in experiencing God, we're saying God is not able. Because God is able to help us deal with anything when we're fully submitted to Him. But in fact, we may have to have people who come around us, not only to help us escape the trap, but help us also stay out of the trap in the future. So we may need accountability partners and people we can call, talk to, get help. And so Jesus does the say, if you can't get the log out of your eye, don't help anyone. He says, first, take the log out of your own eye. That's a command. We don't have permission to just leave it that way. Then you will see clearly to take the speck out. Are we asked to take the speck out? Obviously, the passage says, you will see clearly to take out the speck. That is our responsibility in the body of Christ for our brothers and sisters to say, guys, don't get on the construction materials. Dad's warned us. But when they get up there and they get hurt, we just don't say, oh, well, deal with it. We go and we collect them up and we take them and wrap their leg in the towel. and We take them to the doctor's office and we, you know, deal with the stitches and we help carry them around. And we're having to get up as big brother in the middle of the night and take them to the bathroom and, you know, and, and all this kind of stuff. And there are consequences that I have to deal with as I help you. And when I fail and I struggle, there are consequences for that where you come and you help me. It's a family. And so as we look at that passage, this is not an excuse not to work in each other's life. Verse 43, for there's no good tree that produces bad fruit, or on the other hand, bad tree that produces good fruit, for each tree is known by its fruit. As you look at this, this is like real black and white situation. Each tree is known by its own fruit, good or bad. Men do not gather figs from thorns, Grapes from briars, a good man of his treasure, good treasure of his heart brings forth what's good. Even man out of evil treasure, what brings forth is evil, for his mouth speaks that which fills his heart. Why is Jesus putting this in here? Well, as you begin to Because he loves us, he disciplines every son whom he receives. He scourges, spanks everyone. And so 
just like our Father in Heaven says, stay off of the construction material. And then he has an, a child who is older, who is standing in the backyard that says, remember, Dad says, stay off of the construction materials. It's, it's dangerous. Then there's still that older child's responsibility to point out, look, your attitude is going to cause you problems. The sin that you're accepting, this attitude that you have, and I'm not telling you this because, quote, unquote, I'm judging you. Don't judge me. I'm better than you. No, I'm not. I'm just telling you what Daddy said. I'm just telling you what Daddy said. Now, if you'll take that home today, everything else that we're talking about here is a matter of remembering that we're not going to stand on the construction materials ourselves and look at our brother and say, you shouldn't be up here. We have to stay off of the construction materials. If we're on them, we need to get down. And we need to tell our brothers and sisters what Daddy said. So try to think of it in these terms. Now, notice, if you would, in verse uh, John chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus says this. Well, that's contradictory. He told us not to judge, but then he tells us to judge according, not to judge according to appearance, but to judge with righteous judgment. You see, is this going to be consistently interpreted? But well, we have to remember what does judge mean in this situation. We're making a decision. We're evaluating. But in this case, we're not going to just go by appearances. Because sometimes we're going to think that people are doing things that are sin and they're not. No, they're doing something. We think it's a sin, but it's not a sin. You see, we haven't got a right standard of judgment. Did Jesus deal with that? Absolutely. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were constantly coming. Oh, your disciples, they were going to the field on the Sabbath. And they got the wheat. And they went like that. And they blew the chaff off and they ate it. Sinners! And Jesus had to say, God, come on. King David, he ate the holy bread. So whenever we come up with a standard for what's good or not good, well, you know, you really you can't uh, listen to that kind of music. If you listen to that kind of music, you're all going to burn in hell. Okay? Music is not going to result in anybody burning in hell. What you do with Jesus decides where your eternal destiny is. However, do we need to have good judgment when we consider the content of the music that we listen to? Right? What is this music telling us to how to live and how to think? And what kind of morals is it encouraging? And so it's not the type of music, but the good judgment comes with the content of the lyric. We have to judge according to our righteous judgment. Well, if I'm going to find a righteous judgment, where am I going to find one? You see, it's the instructions, not only for how to avoid getting in the bear trap, but it's the instructions of how to get out. It's the instructions to encourage each other to judge with righteous judgment to be able to help each other. And so in 1 Corinthians, we have a, an extreme situation in verse chapter 5, verse 9. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean immoral people of this world or with covetous and swindlers and idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is a moral person, covetous, idolater, reviler, drunkard, swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Is there a point at which Christians have to make decisions about judging people who are not Christians, the answer is never. We don't judge people who are not Christians because Daddy didn't tell them that it was supposed to be a certain way. That's not Daddy to them. That's judge. God is judge to them, not Daddy. But once you've been born again, He's no longer judge. He's Father. Who obviously evaluates His children and spanks them 
loves them and disciplines them. But it's a different situation. Uh, there's not a judge here who, who makes a court decision on some person's life situation and then and then you know sends them off to jail and says, Well, I'll be there to see you every Thursday. And all that sounds like that. So here we are within the body of Christ in the church. Is there supposed to be a sense of judging happening here? What kind of judging? The kind that says, I love you, I care about you, you're in danger. The thing that you're involved with is going to hurt you. It's not appropriate to live in immorality. You shouldn't be sexually immoral or immoral in your business practices. You shouldn't want things that belong to other people. You shouldn't put anything in your life above God. Not fishing, not lake houses, not sports, not spouses. You shouldn't be a person who constantly reviles and puts people down. You're not supposed to be a drunkard. You're not supposed to be getting money from people illegally. And if you are doing that as a Christian, God is telling me I have to separate myself from you socially. Why? Well, this is not nanny nanny boo boo. I'm going to go tell dad. What happens in our household, school teachers? What happens in the classroom when you have absolutely no tools to establish discipline and control? If there are no consequences that they can see for the choices that they're making, if they can live this kind of lifestyle and absolutely nothing happens, have we done the loving thing or have we just pushed them off into the constant consequences of their sin? And so we're called 